seconds. What's that? I will confirm shortly. Hi, um, my name is Sean Barnes. I'm the gallery director at the Leo Fuller um, Gallery here at South Puget Sound Community College in the Kenneth J. Menard Center for the Arts. And this is the third and final uh, artist talk for the 2023 Southwest Washington Regional Juried Art Exhibition. Um, and tonight I'm here uh, sitting with uh, Susan Rand and Neil Peck, two of uh, two artists from our community that are in this year's exhibition. And before I begin, um, I always like to start with a land acknowledgement um, that and recognize that South Puget Sound Community College is located on the ancestral lands of the Stachos Band of the Squaxin Island Tribe and the Nisqually Indian Tribe, who have long been stewards of the land, the region's waters, plants, and animals. The southernmost point of the Salish Sea, these lands were and still are a place of gathering, trade, and community for many Coast Salish peoples. We recognize that all who are not Salish peoples are visitors here. We commit to join these peoples to share their history, build relationships, increase representation, and restore the living world around us. Uh, one of the ways that uh, SPSEC honors this acknowledgement is through our work with regional tribes. The LEO collaborates with guest curators from the Salish community um, and to produce exhibitions that highlight the arts and crafts of uh, uh, Salish traditions and contemporary art. Our next exhibition is in, no in November. Um, I believe it's the 13th is when that show opens. Um, and uh, that exhibition uh, is curated by Yvonne Peterson and uh, honoring the work of Hazel Pete uh, from the Chehalis tribe. Um, okay, so uh, allow me to introduce our artists. Uh, Susan Aran was born in the Midwest and received her MA in art from Ohio State University. She moved to the Northwest to teach art at the Evergreen State College. She served as tenured faculty there, teaching sculpture, ceramics, drawing, painting, art history, and the humanities until 2018. As a faculty member at Evergreen, Susan team taught with biologists, ecologists, geologists, chemists, philosophers, psychologists, and anthropologists. Um, and uh, all of that, that uh, informs your work. Uh, these experiences deepened her knowledge of the natural world and significantly informed her artworks over the years. Susan has worked in a variety of media, from sculpture and printmaking to painting. Her images consistently reflect her passion for nature and her philosophical inquiry into symbols, metaphor, consciousness, and the nature of perception. Susan is represented by the Childhood's End Gallery here in Olympia. My other artist here, uh, Neil Peck, is from, uh, is from the Pacific Northwest and is retired from the Washington Department of Ecology. Also, I'm sure, a career that's greatly informed your practice. Uh, Neil is a largely self-taught artist and printmaker, and he studied wood engraving and printmaking with master wood engraver Carl Montford in Seattle. Neil's artwork consists of block prints made by carving on the end grain of a block of hardwood or a hard polymer resin, and making prints, uh, and making prints, the, uh, excuse me, and printing the blocks using an old hand crank printing press. Neil's mission is to create art that is joyful in spirit, universal in nature, and that is accessible and affordable to others. Some of his inspirations include the birds, animals, and mountains of his native Pacific Northwest. He is fascinated with, uh, excuse me, he is fascinated by subjects which give him the opportunity to explore the textures and patterns which can be made with the various engraving tools. Neil is represented in Olympia at the Artist Gallery and is a regular contributor to exhibitions at the Leo Fuller Gallery, as well as Susan. And so I'd like to welcome our artist. 
And um, so as always, I like to just kick things off uh, with a question, just get the conversation started. And um, uh, here lately, uh, I've been thinking about just life experiences and what what brings us to artists or to making art as artists, right? Like there can be life experiences or an art experience. For me, I, when I was a kid and I saw, um, I grew up in Southeast Missouri, so I saw uh, one of, I saw Thomas Hart Benton's work in the state capitol. And, you know, I, I was little and I got it, you know, and never looked back. So um, I'll just pose that question to you both then, like what, what prompted your desire to begin an art life, to get into art? Go ahead. Well, I was saying that I really got interested in relief printing because, you know, I used to watch my mother and father make linoleum cut Christmas cards when, we, when I was growing up in Seattle. Um, I, was, I, I loved everything about it and always, you know, always wanted to do it myself, but I, I actually didn't I didn't actually start it until I was about 40 years old, or it's about you know the year after the year after my son was born. Uh, and I did Christmas cards exclusively for you know a number of years after that. But um, you know when my father died in 2008, and you know it kind of struck me as like a you know sort of like a New Year's you know resolution or whatever, but uh, you know to you know, really pursue the wood engraving that I had just begun to work with. And, you know, I think it was really, for me, it was kind of a way of dealing with my father's death and, you know, just confronting, accepting my, you know, my mortality now that the man that had always been in front of me was gone. Um, and, you know, just to do the thing that I had always felt inside that I wanted to do, but reminds me of a, there's an interview with Ethan Hawke, mm -hmm. and he's talking about how, you know, it's like, you guys have probably seen it, I think it's on social media a lot, but he's talking about, it's like, nobody really cares about art or poetry, nobody really thinks about it, until there is this catalyst in their life. Mm -hmm. You lose somebody, or you meet somebody, or, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then we start, start moving towards those things that are more abstract, Require some other way to express things. Yes, well, certainly, you know, with a new, with a new child, you know, um, you know, we wanted him to see and experience creativity and art, and make, you know, we're putting great emphasis on making that available to him. But um, then, you know, when that, you know, that Christmas came around, um, we were thinking about, you know what to do for a Christmas card, and then I said, let me make one. Yeah. That's great. Well, I want to come back to some part of that, because um, I, I, I have a quote. Um, I think it's the one from Emerson, but we'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, um, well, I, I, can't, I always made stuff. I, it, was the way I, it was the one way I got into trouble, was because I was down in the basement mucking around with my dad's tools when I was a kid. Partly it was because uh, as one of five children, it was I could get a little quiet and space and control over things. And it was um, a way, weirdly, to be close to my dad, who would go down there and use projects. Uh, so I, I don't remember, but it took me a long time to think about being an artist. I would, I would make stuff. Like I remember one Christmas in middle school when I decided to make Christmas presents for everybody, a, a marionette puppet theater and the puppets for my younger siblings. And the artwork I'm most proud of to this day, uh, I took a, we, we used to have little straps to hold kids in high chairs before the trays and belts. I took one of those, painted it red with enamel paint, made a little chin thing and made my, a snore no more for my dad. <laughs> to hold a what? A snore no more. A snore. And then I made a stop him from snoring. A snore, like, right, like, right, right. right. Basically a nose clamp. And packaged it and wrote it up. Congratulations, you, you, your very own snore no more. And when he passed away, cleaning out, there it was at the back of the drawer. <laughs> he, he had kept it all the years. Anyway, I, so I was always crafty and, and making stuff. And I think my mom recognized that. But I grew up in an environment, very conservative, 
Ohio, no artists in the family, no museum access. Uh, my dad very, uh, raised very conservative religious. Art was a sort of a suspect, you know, leads to moral decay, etc. You know, you don't want it too happy or too frivolous or something. Uh, and so my mother was supportive, but uh, so I, I did art as I could throughout school, but uh, she died suddenly when I was just going off to college. And so I, I did what my dad suggested. He said, do something where you can get a job. So I actually did my major as an, un, uh, in French, prepared to teach middle school French. Did my student teaching and thought, nah, this is not my demographic. Um, and so then I left, I applied to graduate school, got in, and, but it took me a long time to think of myself as an artist. I finally realized I was, quote, an artist after I started teaching at Evergreen. And I could go to Daniel Smith Art Store and drop three, four hundred dollars and not bad an eye. And I couldn't do it in any other area of my life. I couldn't go spend it on clothes or dress. But an art store, the materials, the possibilities, the stuff, it was like a kid in a candy store. So, it, yeah, it was not part of my bring, upbringing. I still struggle with the, that, the, the, you know, the art world. But making, I've always thought of myself as an image maker, as a maker. And um, I think everybody has that in them, unless it gets you know, squelched out of them somewhere along the edge. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's an, a, a nice segue into one of my questions, and this is a question I think, <clears throat> well, that I love to ask often uh, of artists. But um, so, do you have a ritual of making? Do you have like something? I think all artists do to a certain extent. They may not realize it or not, but um, like, do you have? Like, do you have to do a space prep? Like, sometimes I have, I do a lot of nesting when I am preparing work, which eats up sometimes a half hour. But, um, what, what's your ritual of making? Either one. I have to do, I have to start by cleaning up. Uh, you know, I'm just, I need a clean surface. It's, it's kind of, and then I have to look at my work again. It's remarkable how, you know, you, you make work and then you, if you put it away, it's as if you didn't make it. Because uh, it's, and, um, so you have to keep work up and look at it. And then I look back through my, um, my notebooks or my journals and I have image files. I look back and I think, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's what I, that's what I was, that's what I was thinking for that. And um, then I'm ready to go. I mean, sometimes I'll do what writers, what I've heard that writers often do is that they'll, you know, leave, they'll, they'll break off writing with one sentence on the next page so they, they already have the start. And I'll sometimes do that where I'll get to the end of the day in the studio and I'll say, okay, tomorrow morning, the first thing I need to do is fix that, wipe that out, take that out or whatever, and then, and then it's like you're in, you're in it again. Yeah. Do you think some of, that, some of that preparation, that cleanliness has to do with with the manner of working, so you work in oil. You work in a lot of, a lot of different media, actually. Yeah, kind of, yeah. I, uh, well, yeah, oil's kind of a messy medium, so it really helps to start by cleaning up. But more, it's really more like um, it's it's more like just quieting the visual field, so that the attention, instead of being distracted by a lot of stuff lying around. Some people can do it, but I can't. Um, it, it's, then I can turn my attention to the feeling that I'm thinking about and, and or the, I, the idea that I'm trying to bring through in a piece of work. Yeah, that makes sense. How about you, Ian? Well, the kind of obvious one for a, a wood engraver is that you have to sharpen your tools before <laughs> Before you start on something, but uh, you know, usually there's a lot more in terms of uh, you know just working up the image. You know, that they start you know they start with a photograph that uh, you know then involves some you know tracing and other drawing and things to you know cropping, sizing, and uh, you know then. You know, then there, 
is the um, matter of uh, you know, actually getting that image onto a block. And, you know, if, you know, if some reasonably strong form on paper, and then put it on top of the block, and you pour mineral spirits on it, and run the whole hot iron thing over the whole surface, to, and you know, you get something that kind of has what you want, but needs some work. So. I mean, that's all preparatory to making a first cut or anything, but, you know, then, you know, uh, well, there are other little things like when, you know, whenever I'm, you know, if I'm doing an image that, you know, whether it's human or animal, uh, you know, if it has eyes uh, in it, I always find the place that I really want to start is just right in the, you know, looking for that little highlight in the pupil of the eye. And just start from there, and if you can get that right, uh, if I can get that right, then there's hope for the image. <laughs> so, uh, what? Uh, how about the? I mean, do, are you coming into the studio, either of you? Are you coming to the studio ready to work, or is is there a mental prep? I mean, that, so there's the prepping the space and getting tools and things like that, but. Um, when you walk into the studio or when you're thinking about going into the studio, and I guess that my other question is like, how does that work begin for you? How does, how does an idea come to you? Um, and how do you keep ideas fresh and evolving? Like, so, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to work. What am I going to work on? Right? What, what is the idea? What's the motivation there? Yeah. Well, I... Observations in you know, uh, you know, just even walking around outdoors, you know, just things like seeing how snow falls on the bark of a tree trunk, you know, and um, I'm looking at things like that and thinking, you know, like how, you know, how could I represent that, you know, how would that turn into a wood engraving, and you know, I look for images that have certain types of compositions with, you know, um, con strong contrasts of, you know, light to dark and, uh, you know, areas that can be, you know, that can be developed with, you know, particular kinds of textures and markings that, you know, I mean, really there are only three things you can do with, uh, with, with a, a wood graver, those are dots, you know, just push down marks that are you know, just short things, they have a little direction to them, but the thing is if you get enough of them, you know, in a particular area, they can convey some energy and, you know, and, and suggest a light value, whatever. And then the lines, you know, the lines, you know, have, you know, they have direction, they have energy. Um, and then the last thing, things cross hatching that uh, has some you know, uh, you know that, that where, where you can really you know work and adjust the value of you know value of an area. So being in the world and, and, and experiencing natural world or different mm -hmm. you know. yeah yeah I you know I don't get out into the mountains as much as I you know used to would like to um, but you know, I'm, as I like to say, I'm always looking, and, you know, as I'm, you know, as I'm looking at those things, I look at a lot of other pictures. I try to, you know, I, I try not to rip off anybody's pictures, but often just use ones from my family and friends, and, you know, fortunately, I have some pretty prolific photographers who are fairly close, <laughs> so, so do it like that. Those are the times, too, uh -huh. um, taking pictures. Yeah. How about you? It, it, it seems like what you're asking more is um, you put you put it in terms of ritual, but it seemed like you were really asking about what is the kind of the source of the work, or how do you? Yeah, in addition, tap there was the ritual, but then also that part of the ritual. You know, before you enter the church, right? right. Like there's. Right. Right. Um, it feels to me, especially the older I get, it feels to me like I'm still making, I'm still
still trying to make work that is about uh, questions and understandings that I uh, started think things I started thinking about in my twenties. You know that I can that uh, kind of a what how is it that you go beyond the, the visible world to something that is sacred or um, and, and in what way do you, can you make th can, through intensive, intensely looking at something in the natural world, can you make a, an experience and, um, for oneself? I mean, I do it for myself as a kind of practice, as a kind of meditation, as a kind of world making of the world that I want to live in, you know, where there's spirit and there's magic and there's this kind of mystery and, um, and and for me it's often I mean it's in the beauty of some natural form but it's also in the quality of the light um, and uh, in the saturation of color and, um, um, so but the, the, the questions so it's it's about trying to trying to make a kind of an image is a kind of a doorway potentially into some other place for me and um, uh, what what I what I'm really interested in is how is it that you can make an image of something very specific, but try to make it feel like that connects you to something universal. And um, you'll probably never get it, but <laughs> why not try? <laughs> so anyway, so that so my in terms of the, how do I get into it, I have to kind of remind myself sometimes. The world is very it's very hard to remember those things in the our world now. Noisy and chaotic, of forty-seven thousand images assaulting you before breakfast when you're just trying to get your email, and um, so it's a, so. I sometimes I read poetry and I or I quiet. I just lie and do a little meditation, or I go out in the garden and read something, you know, which is for me a kind of walking, moving meditation, or I just go back and look at the work and think, oh yeah, that's what I was doing, or I look at other artists' work who, for me. Have that has that quality, and um, and then I'm kind of back in that. Oh yeah, uh, it pulls me back in. Yeah, I um something, and this this brings me back to your original comment about you know uh, when you were talking about your father, and and this also is this Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. Um, the one thing he says, the one thing which we seek with insatiable desire is to forget ourselves, to be surprised out of our propriety, to lose our sempiternal memory, and to do something without knowing how or why, in short, to draw a new circle. And I, I kind of hear that resonating, and I, I came to this kind of through reading your statement and thinking about you know, when we experience the natural world and how that informs us as artists. My, my work also stems from that. And, um, but that art process um, and entering a studio space, entering, entering a land space, I think is that, um, it's just that. And so what I'm, I'm curious about is like, is there a connection um, or what is the connection uh, that you have between your love of these natural sub subjects and the time that you spend crafting them. You, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, like you're talking about like the snow falling and then thinking about how does that translate into engraving or the shadow box or, you know, and assemblage type surfaces. Deep question, I guess, I don't know. But. You had the phrase really. I know. know it's, really I, that's that's me. My brain is. No, 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 I'm. No, no, no. I, I have. Like, I have a hard time sometimes articulating things. <laughs> but like, um, so like, uh, what is that connection between like the love of natural subjects, being out in the natural world, um, and or or being you know, thinking about your concepts and the ideas, and and the time spent crafting them. There's a, there's a Mary Oliver poem about 
when she ta she talks about her work is to be a witness of just how astonishing. You know, she talks about you know, just look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. And she names all these wonderful things, and she says uh, my work is and I have that I have, and she constantly has to remember is just to stand still and be amazed. And I when I read that poem, I thought that's it. Stand stand and be amazed, and remember to just be amazed in the moment. You know, that so much is there. And um, and for me, the, part of that is that, it, that there's this gorgeous thing, astonishing thing there. And then my mind goes, okay, a thousand years ago it was something else, and a ten thousand years ago it was something else, and a hundred uh, million years ago it was something else, and then it could be, you know. So how do you, so, and so the, the, the connection between the natural, looking at these, the natural world and the time it takes to craft the image is the time for me, I, I could, when I see something that is re really amazes me, it's just a pleasure to sit and take a week trying to make that thing because it's, uh, the joy of just slow, being slow and looking, when everything around us is go faster, go faster, go faster. It's like slow food, or it's like just, okay, I almost have, I can craft it, and the time doesn't seem long. It seems like an opportunity to connect with the form, to slow myself down, to really see it in a way that we don't usually look these days in the world. We, we look and we, we name it and we go on. You, when, I'm too, when I was working with students, it, it, we, we did a lot of study about human vision about, and, and about seeing and teach, and most of teaching students how to make art was teaching them to slow down and look at what they make. And, and it turns out when people go to galleries and museums, the average time they spend on any given piece of work is three seconds. You know. So for me, it just it's a pleasure. And it's a connection through time and space with what that was, is now, and what it was, and might become in the future. I don't know how to say it any differently than that. I, that I, I think that's what I was looking for in that question. I, yeah. yeah, well, I just strongly agree that when I see something, find something that, you know, that, that really speaks to me with, you know, qualities that it has. Um, yeah, it, it's just, just love, you know, spending as much time as it takes. And, you know, for, for me, that can probably be, you know, usually one to six months, you know, just working on, you know, working on the image and, you know, trying to get it to, you know, trying to, you know, find the right combination of strokes and engraving that I can do to bring it out and hopefully by the time I'm done I've captured some of those qualities of it that, you know, made me think this was exceptional in the first place. But, um, but it is fun to just go slow and to, you know, just get deeply involved with, you know, with this image and, you know, both as, you know, both as an image that of something that exists out there but also as with the physical object you know if I'm actually working to you know to create yeah now, the, this question arose for me um, because of um, both of your processes I, I've worked with oils I've worked representationally I've, I've uh, I minored in intaglio mm -hmm. um, never tackled this. And so both of these processes, I, you know, there are slow builds sometimes and there can be layering and there can be um, also, uh, well, and, and they're so time consuming. And so that, that, that's what brought me to, to this question the most, I think, was just that the time spent in making work. And I, I think you know another artist that um, 
that works with the natural world and thinks about the cosmos, Anselm Kiefer, um, you know, s some of his paintings he leaves sitting outside for like a couple of years before he comes back to him and he brings them into the studio and they've crumbled, they've dried, they're and then he slowly works back through the layers and might even re remove whole layers of an image. And, um, and I th that connection between being an artist and a maker and the time spent. Um, and it can be reflected in the work, it's reflected in the, the concepts and the subject. Um, so I, I think it's great. Some, I mean, some, like a, I've done a number of public art commissions and there you have to be all up front, have the concept worked out, have the timeline worked out, have the blueprints, engineering, da, da, da. it's a, such a different process, you know, because you have to know everything about it and then you start in and you just execute this thing. And uh, I've, what I've discovered is there's always a recovery period from being in that mindset afterwards where I have to remember that uh, I, I don't usually work that way, where it's more in terms of time, it's more like waiting for the whole image to come back like a dream. You get a little piece and you start and then you like like pulling it on the thread to get the dream back, you know. Um, where it's not all planned out and you leave it, leave it open. Um, so there's that way of thinking about time with the image. You know, see what it's going to become. Let it talk to you. Let it, you know, for me. Yeah. Yeah, to let it let it just kind of emerge from the process yeah. or as time goes on and because images, although they're still, they're always changing. Yeah. And yeah, and then that, that planned thing. I appreciate that. Do you, um, that, those two different um, ways of working. Well, let me, uh, let me just ask this, because this, this is curious to me also. Um, I think you all, you both are, are wonderful composers. You, you find, um, you find subjects and images uh, in your images to to compose the space, and so I'm I'm curious about um, you know how we all, we often use different design principles to compose compose an image, um, spatial principles like perspective, contrasting forms. Um, do you have specific compositional devices um, or organizational principles that that you use to guide viewers? Are there things you come back to? often to, to structure an image? Well, um, one, of the, one of the things that's actually quite important is you know, white space. You know, that, uh, you know, to give the, uh, you know, give the viewer's eye, you know, an area to rest on. You know, it's sometimes difficult to remember, you know, You know, probably the first, you know, one of the first rules the wood engraver has to observe is don't cut away too much too fast, you know, because you can't get any of it back, you know. But on the other hand, uh, you, you also have to remember to not make, you know, not make the image too busy, you know. Leave some, leave some white space uh, in, the image of the two girls in the field. Um, you know, um, yeah, when I was finishing that, I was like certain that there had to be some clouds up in the sky up there. And I, you know, tried, you know, I, I tried making, uh, I tried making some clouds and they didn't come out very well. and. Eventually, I realized that I had that I had like oriented them in line with the top edge of the uh, of the you know the picture frame, and so they really were all wrong anyway. And so then I was thinking, how could I recut these, uh, you know, to get them so that they actually you know are more in the plane, you know, in the angle of the image, and. You know, finally, it was just hopeless, so I just cut them out all together. 
And when I did that, uh, you know, that, then, uh, you know, everybody said, oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, just, you know, now, now it's right. <laughs> and so, so that's, you know, one of, that's one of the principles that I, you know, constitutional principles I always try to follow is to, um, you know, don't, you know, don't let the final image be too busy. Uh, you know, and give the, you know, give the viewer a place to rest in it. Which I, I suspect is, is a challenge with engraving because some of the allure and the draw to that is, is the line work. Mm -hmm. Um, and and the textures are, yes. are very appealing. Mm -hmm. Tiny details, is very, very, yeah. But yeah. just don't have too many of them. Uh -huh. No, and I think in that balance, uh, balancing that and juggling those elements um, is, and you know, just looking here, at the, rather than a dark outline, there's a white outline mm -hmm. for the yes. making that compositional choice break the, those two spaces mm -hmm. um, and it gives a certain certain luminosity to mm -hmm. to the landscape yeah. that sometimes can be there at twilight or mm -hmm. early in the morning yeah it was, was intended to be kind of a sunset image and you know you could see how the uh, you know the, the, the right edge of it is darker compared to the left Sun setting in the you know it's kind of the you know the northwest side of uh, or actually kind of over you know it's the north side so anyway there's it's west there. Susan, are there things that you compositions that you come back to often as as an I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember what's on, in the website whether some of the older works are in there the black and white drawings is whether I've taken all that out. Let's see. Let's see. Go back to it. Uh, and there's recent oh, I think, stuff. Yeah, so I, I took it I, right now. I don't have it up there. Anyway, um, it's an interesting question. Um, for a long, long time, um, I, I found myself making everything uh, with these strong diagonals. At the con there, there was always a kind of crossing diagonals. I worked for about 10 years in black and white, these big charcoal drawings. And, um, I went to that after I'd, I'd been working in ceramics and I'd been making these triangular shaped magic boxes that were cases for magic wings and they were hanging up and stuff like that. And there was something about that triangular shape of the wing unfolding that was just so compelling to me, this triangle, 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 and crisscrossing. And then, and that was, uh, it, it worked compositionally. I mean, I was attentive to principles of design and balance of light and dark. And, you know, color and stuff like that, but I just couldn't work in a rectangle for a long time. And then, now, for the last number of years, it's been, I, I find myself stacking, either stacking vertically or stacking horizontally. And it started, uh, if you can do the, yeah, that, the Dwelling Places series, it started here with, I had made just a whole bunch of these small little panels, and I was thinking about the I Ching, where you get these Trigrams, if you go that way, um, that have images like fire over water, and they, I mean, they give you an image of something in your life. And um, but they were always two or three levels that you stacked up. And I started thinking, oh, that's kind of like the structure of a life. Once you get into, once you've lived for a little while, you've got the basement, and then you've got your, the, you know, your middle life, what's going on in your day to day, and then your attic. You know where all these hopes and thoughts and stuff are, and I sort of started thinking about you know these levels as the levels that we accumulate in our life, like strata. Or like or, you know, I used to live here, now I live up here, or now I'm living down here, and that stacking and uh, thinking about it was also about okay you see these you see three images in a row or three images side by side how does that push your perception because you have to hold them together and flip back and forth between them and um, so i know there's something about trying to visually depict a kind of 
an experience of life where you're trying to live at different levels simultaneously, you're trying to integrate the past experiences, um, past, integrate different emotions. Uh, sometimes the house catches on fire. Sometimes you gotta get out the window, leave. Um, and then in the natural world, you're holding, trying to hold past, present, near, far, together at the same time when you're experiencing a present moment. You know, uh, so I'll get on, I'll find, it's more, it's less starting, it's less starting consciously with an intentional compositional strategy than finding myself com uh, using it over and over again and then I start thinking, why am I using it? And then I understand what the heck I'm doing. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. not just a, a not <laughs> the just a way. Of, Sorry, the house got fired there. <laughs> but, but not just a, a way of organizing the space, but also helping to guide the narrative. Yeah. Well, yes, but I but it, but what I, I think my the point was that um, I find myself compelled to work in a certain way for a long period of time, and then I understand. Oh, okay, it's actually it's a pretty darn good metaphor for what I'm trying to think about in my life right now. You know, and then it'll change. I'm actually starting to shift away now from the, to something else. Okay. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and just thinking of that, oops, let me get to where I can navigate this. Um, whoops. I just want to go back. Um, the last thought. Yeah, and then um, that's evident I think also just looking at this this collage here of of your work that these how that how that's happening mm -hmm. um, at times mm -hmm. especially like here this is a whole yeah this this kind of open composition that's very very uh, congested mm -hmm. and and compressed space and. Um, strong foreshortening, um, and even in here, even though there's layering, there's a similar kind of... Boy, the colors look strange on here. <laughs> oh, well. oh, yeah, the tr this project, I love the projector, it's wonderful, but... Because I'm seeing it, I'm seeing something different here. The colors, they're mm -hmm. not. My, my laptop looks very different. <laughs> I, okay, yeah, this, this is a, a question that I have because I, for you guys, because I used to work representation, portraits for years. I have portraits all over Southwest Alaska and a lot of landscape and genre scenes and that sort of thing. And, um, and I came across this, uh, uh, you know, just thinking about um, for decades now, I'm just gonna read what I wrote up here. It's a little long, bear with me. But for decades now, artists have been expanding uh, their craft, experimenting with mixed media, myself included, photography, site-specific work, you even working with found objects and, and different art forms, performance art, relational aesthetics, making, which is, you know, making art uh, inspired by human relations and other social, in their social context. Um, and even, you know, where, uh, you know, artists are, concerning it with like de-skilling, de you know, literally just abandoning technical mastery. Um, and, you know, for the sake of just a low production and an amateur aesthetic. Um, and you're both working in very classical technical materials for, for much of your work. Um, and we're working with oils and, um, and wood engraving. Um, I moved away from that. And so I'm curious, and so I work more expressively and with a variety of mixed media. And I'm curious to, uh, to hear you all talk about maybe some of the merits of working representationally and working with craft or these te these very old, much older, because it's not easy to just start painting with oil and it has a wonderful history 
of mastery of craft, and the same with wood engraving going back to the you know 13th century, right? And so, if you guys can talk about that, if the merit, just the merits of working with those materials, you can interpret that question however you want. Well, um, one of the one of the hazards of teaching was that I learned too many techniques. I, you know, I did photography. Photography, printmaking, and I was, and I love all kinds of art. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I secretly aspire to being a completely wild and crazy abstract expressionist, um, except that it's so nice to put in and, and look through the details. So I'm always kind of drawn back to that just because it's soothing and I can do it. But anyway, but um, I don't think of oil paint as an old, I mean, I know it's, you know, it's a very old medium, but my, my, my choice to to kind of stick with oil painting um, is because I, I actually started with ceramics, you know, as a sculptor. And it, you know, in terms of paint, it's kind of the closest thing to clay. It's thick, it's really nice to handle. I painted a lot with acrylics, gouache, uh, uh, and it, I, for me, as a, it's actually an environmental choice because I don't use any solvents. Um, I have a practice where I, the, practically no paint goes down the drain. And, and uh, it, the, you know, well the, in all paints, all, the pigments are all the same across whatever paint it is. It's just the binder, the oil or the acrylic polymer or the, you know, that differs. And so the uh, linseed oil or walnut oil, the binder in oil paint is non-toxic, it biodegrades. And I just couldn't bear putting more polymers down, plastic polymers down into the water system, basically. It's, I don't like the hand the way acrylics handle all that are getting better. Um, golden acrylics has now finally developed a way to capture out the polymers to, be, to, to uh, precipitate them out. You can look on, on their website and get a little chemistry, little kit of stuff, and precipitate all the acrylic out and you're left with pretty clean water if you're an acrylic painter. And so, you know, that, that opens up possibilities again. But I use a, you know, I use a water-soluble oil paint. Um, I, I rinse it, I have a rinse bucket, I rinse all the paint out of the brush, then I evaporate the, that water out by just pouring it out on newsprint, and um, then that just goes in the trash. So no paint goes down the sink. So it's that, for me, it's a choice, partly because I like to blend the effects, and so it's slow, but I don't think of it as an, I don't think of it as, a, I, it's not, I don't use it because it's a traditional medium. I use it because it works with the imagery that I like, blended soft effects, foggy effects, um, and because there's less stuff going in the water system, um, and because it's more saturated in color so and it, so it's easier to you know get high contrast lights and luscious surfaces for me than with acrylic. Well, yeah, I also use oils and yeah, you know, likewise, never put anything down the drain. Uh, just keep well keep soaking it up in rags, and it's amazing how much they'll actually hold, and uh, you know, eventually they do have to go in the trash, but it, it's, again, you know, just linseed oil varnish as the base for it. Um, but uh, I think, you know, on, you know, I, I do admire, you know, abstract and, you know, Styles of art that you know would, can be very loose composition and you know uh, just very bold you know bold lines and things and I would love to be able to do that. Um, I just don't feel like I can do it very well. And you know, for me, one of the things is that I um, I've always had a problem with drawing because I, I you know I have uh, a natural hand tremor. And it does really affect my ability to, you know, uh, you know draw any kind of a large line. Um, but the thing about wood engraving that is actually so good is movements involved. 
vault are so small that they're within the tolerances of my, of my tremors. So I'm, so, yeah, so I'm actually working within the tremors uh, wow. and doing that. And just try not to, you know, the, the, the danger is, of course, that you may get a random scratch somewhere that you don't want it. But um, I, I am also, you know, I'm, I'm looking at other, you know, other forms of printing um, with, uh, um, you know, holograph and, uh, you know, the work of uh, Carol Summers uh, back in the 60s and 70s that, uh, you know, he did some, you know, very large, you know, or very old um, prints that were often made by, you know, they were often made by, you know, he was rolling ink onto, um, you know, onto a Japanese paper and, you know, just actually, but actually just letting it permeate through. And so the image that he was actually presenting was, you know, the reverse side of where he had applied it. And um, anyway, but I'm, you know, I'm just starting to try those things and have to see if I can, you know, if I can actually create something. worthy. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, and, you know, perhaps one of the, you know, most intriguing things is the possibility of combining, you know, somehow combining these other types of styles with elements of wood engraving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so having, um, you know, having bold, you know, large I love, the, I love the idea of um, thinking about these techniques, um, you know, as being in service to our inspirations yeah. and having, um, also having, uh, you know, a role in, in, in building the narrative um, as opposed to, you know, because sometimes there's, you know, there's, there's ideas about a certain, um, let me say like, like an ethic of, of working in certain ways, especially nowadays, that if you work, you know, if you're working traditionally or if you're working with a human figure for that matter, or if you're then somehow um, it's, it's passe or obsolete and that we should reconsider the object or re reconsider the artifact. And so I, not that I, I hold these views, but you know, that, that that is a conversation Love seeing. I mean, I went so I went to the Venice Biennale, um, not the last one, the one before that. Anyway, and it's just so it's so exciting to walk through and see young contemporary artists, and they're making work out of who knows what, and it's fantastic, and I love it. And um, and so I'm always attracted. Okay, I can I know how to, I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. But you know, I'm I'm 72, and at some point you just start cleaning your closets out. You try to spare your kid from having, you know, how much stuff do they have to get rid of when they're gone? And and I'm trying. So I find myself, you know, I, I I am with art processes. I would try everything. I would work in everything except there's only so many hours in the day, and it takes time to develop the technical proficiency and figure it out and. I mean, I, don't, I did some glass blowing, and I would have, I would do it in a heartbeat. If I, you know, had the time, and I were now 40, I'd go for it. Um, and, and um, but you start, I, I'm intentionally trying to limit it myself. All right, I've been, I have a whole other series of, like, artist book projects in Ukraine, and then more ceramic stuff, and, and, and it's like, stop, stop, narrow, narrow, down, and, you know, limit your, because there's not enough time left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these, these the, the techniques and materials and, and our approaches to making are always, 
I, I think, always in flux. They're always changing. I saw a remarkable exhibition up at Bainbridge Island. I'm blanking her name, but I followed her work for years. Uh, she was a painter, then she's a glass blower. And, uh, wait. Anyway, she had the painted, she had artworks that now have augmented reality. So you, you put the app on your phone and then you, you hold it up to the artwork and suddenly you're in a video game and the images start come, you know, it's like 3D images appear out of the painting on your phone. And I thought, okay, I could learn to do that if I had, it, if I had enough time and a good tech guy, you know. But I think I'll just stick with what I can do. You know. Um, I let's see. I'm gonna look at the time. Oh, it's it's seven o'clock. Um, do you guys do you guys have any questions for each other? Are there are there things that maybe you brought or questions you have? We went out for coffee and had a great talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're we're, we're pre talked. All right, you're right. You're done. You're done. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, we should have recorded that. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you guys, though, or, if, you're, if you're willing coffee. to be put on the spot. Because I, I was, you know, I would thank you, first of all, for coming. It was great. And I was curious what, when you go to a gallery or a museum to see artwork, what is it that you're hoping to have happen? What, you know, what are you hoping to experience? To be surprised. To be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to be knocked on my ass. <laughs> you know, I still remember the first time I ever saw a Kandinsky, you know, I was stunned and yeah. I couldn't move. And, you know, so I'm always looking for that. But, but can you say, what is, it, what is it about a work like that that knocks you on your ass? Well, um, I, think what, I think what struck me about that one was I couldn't place it in time, you know? I mean, you know, so much art you see and you think, oh, that's 1930s, you know, that's 1960s. Oh, I, you know, I didn't know when it was. You know, it could have been very old, it could have been very recent. It was just, you know, it just, and I, because I couldn't place it, yeah. I think I was just stunned, you know. It didn't fit into any category, um, any time frame. It was timeless, it, and it was huge. I tried to tell students, you know, I can show you how to do techniques, but you have now this remarkable access to all of the images humans have ever made. And, you, and your teachers might be ancient Egyptians. Who knows? Those might be your people. You could, or people who make cave paintings. You might, that might resonate. Or who knows? Some odd little thing that you find. Go find them. Go look. Go look. Go look. And it's, it's just terrific that we have that access now. Yeah. I, I, just to add to, to Doyle, and it, the, my first experience where I was blown away and at the same time kind of felt welcomed into a work was, you know, you study all this artwork in school or you, you look at it and, you know, it way, you know, way before the internet, but and you see it in magazines or you see it in books, and then you stand in front of a painting. And for me, it was uh, Piet Mondrian. And because I just had, you know, it looks flat, it looks slick, and when you see it in a, in a book, it's flat. And then you stand in front of one of these things, and you see the layers of paint and how every edge is constructed and, and carefully worked in. And, and that was just the physicality was like to be in front of that object and, and to have that feeling of, wow, okay, this, this is not what I thought I was looking at. 
Anybody have any questions for these two? I have a question. So, Neil, you were talking about um, you know comp using your art and maybe combining it with other kinds of art forms. And so I'm sitting here and thinking, what a piece of art would look like if the two of you put your <laughs> artwork together, <laughs> you know, side by side or something. You know. Anyway, I, but I had a question for Susan. So, when you paint these different panels, are you specifically painting for a grouping, or do you paint to separate panels and then move them around and try to figure out what they go, what goes together? Both. Yeah. Sometimes one and sometimes the other. Sometimes I think I know how they're going to go together, and then they don't work, and then I then it's like, oh no, but I know this goes somewhere. And then it's like, where where do you want to go? Yeah. Susan, I have a technical question for you. Yeah. So I work primarily with acrylics. You mentioned you have water-based oils, yet you use linseed oil. The, so they're, they're regular oil paints, but they, they have figured out how to basically make them water-philic instead of phobic. So that it's still... You can still use linseed oil. With yeah, it's still a linseed oil, but it's in an emulsion. So that, it, so that the, the oil, it's a regular oil paint, except the oil acts differently. It is now water-soluble oil. Huh. Mm -hmm. and, and is there a brand you use? Um, I've been, uh, no, let's see. Uh, what am I got? I've got two different brands and I can't, um, I'll think of it in just Duo. They have downtown, Duo downtown. Okay. And then I have, uh, what is the other one I have? I'll have to think of it. I ordered on, I was looking at it online and decided to try that. I'm still experimenting, but they all, they, you know, they're all catching up with each other, all the different brands. Uh, they, they started developing this some 30 years ago. Max was the brand by Grumbacher. They were the first to try to figure out how to make the, the oil emulsified so it would be water, water soluble. And it was terrible. They just was like toothpaste. <laughs> and, so I just said, never forget that. But now it's very good. I mean, they're a little less intense than regular oil paints, but hardly. They, it feels like oil paint. It acts like oil paint. You can mix it up with regular oil paint up to a certain percent, and still it'll wash right out of your brush with soap and water. Oh, thank you. So solvents. The nice thing is, you know, with acrylics, how you can put on a thin wash coat, you can thin it down. You can do that right away, and as the oil, as the water evaporates out. So it speeds up, so you can building with, layers you can with too. Water and still paint. Yep. Oh, yep. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you can get if you, uh, some of the watery effects that you can get with acrylic. Um, if you thin it down too much, basically you've got watercolor, but <laughs> you don't have much of a paint film. But it dries fast, and then you can build over that. And then, yeah, it's it's nice. It's a game changer for oil painters. Yeah. I was curious, I don't, I don't practice making art, but one of the things that impedes me from that is the word mistake. Uh, How does that, like the relationship with the word mistake go into like both of your practices, especially with like working on a wood block for up to six months and or however long you're working on it. Well, um, there are definitely some things you don't want to do. Um, and, well, really, if those end up happening, then, you know, you, you know, you may have to, you know, try to find some way to change the image to, you know, incorporate, you know, to incorporate, you know, that cut there. Um, it still depends what you, you know, what, you know, what you have left to work with, and um, you know, I mean, wood engraving is an unforgiving medium, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, if you, you know, sometimes, you know, when you cut through, if you cut through a line uh, that needs to be, you know, needs to be there. Uh, you know, that line kind of loses its energy and, uh, you know, you can't get it back. But, uh, you know, 
sometimes there are ways to work around things, and you know, uh, but really, you know, you, you just kind of have to, you just have to kind of go ahead and not really, you know, not really worry that a mistake could occur, you know, but just. small, work slow, and kind of build up to, uh, you know, uh, say there may, you know, you may like really want to put off working in this area of, of the block until you're sure enough about what you're doing, and then, you know, and then finally I'm ready to cut that line, and you know, things like that. Neil, Neil's right that the woodblock cutting is a less forgiving medium, but you, it, so it, it, it's a benefit then to work out your idea, your drawing, sketching, etc., and you know what you're going to do, and then it's the technical execution of it. But if you're interested in getting started in image making, then you, are you an image maker? I'm a writer. I wanted to hear you guys talk okay. about mistakes. Okay. Well, I like I make lots of mistakes, <coughs> and I um, and I try to see them as opportunities. And uh, if you're a ceramist to start, as I was uh, to start, you get really good at how to fix things: glue, putty, carbide stuff. You know, you can fix anything and never never know it was messed up. And oil paint, I like oil painting because you can just, if you don't like it, you can paint over it, you can sand it down, you can take it off, you cut it up and stick it into something else. And um, so the mistakes, I often, you know, I just try to see what is it that the thing is wanting to be. I th because I think of it as, as a mistake. May not, it may not be a mistake. It may just be that the image has a different idea than I have. It wants to have, it wants to do this. Who knew? And so trying to stay in a relationship with it where I'm just curious. I'm open and I'm curious and I, I suspend judgment. We leap so fast to judgment. Um, so trying to just stay, oh, let's see what it's becoming. You know? And if I have a real specific idea, then I'll push a little bit. Or, and then sometimes I just let it go and be what it is going to be and then start the next one. Okay, you want to be that. Well, I'm going to do my idea. Okay, thank you very much. You know, so much about you. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I, I, so the mistake, I, I, you just try to get rid of that word. It's just a different thing. It's different than what you thought it wanted to be. Uh, I had, when I was teaching drawing, teaching life drawing, you know, it's, it's remarkable to me that in art, um, it's the one area in life where, stu where people think you either get it instantly, like, some, like God zaps you, boom, you got it, or you don't get it. So I'd have students come into the first day of life drawing, their first ever effort to try to, you know, where's the me? <laughs> and, and they'd, say, they'd try one drawing and say, see, I told you I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, okay, do a hundred and then come back and tell me. because. You know, did you learn to ride a bicycle? Did you, you know, ski? Did you try anything that requires practice or falling down? You know, you learned to walk. Babies all the time. <laughs> you know, and they get up and you try again. But they think that if you can't do it the first time in drawing, it's over. So that's I. So it's I. I think about mistakes like that. Some of it is just more practice. Some of it is just see what. Suspend judgment and see what the image or potential piece of writing wants to be. <laughs> it's something. Be curious about it. I have a question for you then as a writer. Um, what do you do with a piece of writing that just may not work? I mean, is there, are there things you'll write and be like, oh, that's good, but it doesn't fit, or this really sucks, do you just erase it? Or do you hang on somewhere in my Google Drive? <laughs> I don't ever go to it. But I 
keep them, right? It's an idea. Yeah. But yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't always go back to them. And I, I think in making it, it's, it's a similar thing. Yes. Um, there may be a, an end product, uh, a, a look or, you know, an aesthetic that's trying to be achieved, but um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to quote Bob Ross. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are happy accidents. Yeah. But, but there, you know, you know at, like in life, you know, there are mistakes to be made. Well, and often that's how we learn about our materials. And what an image, like you said, is beautiful is, and, and I tell my students the same thing, it may need to be something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's how we also, um, as artists, develop style or mm -hmm. develop mm -hmm. you know, some aesthetic that's unique to us, like writing our signature, you know, that it, it, it will become something. Yeah. I've had the experience in my own work, and I've seen it over and over in students' work, where they're working on a project, a series of images, you know, that wants to be, th they want it to be this, want to be, I'm making a series of images about my family. And suddenly there's this end that, you know, they make something and it's not part of it and they go, oh my God, I, this is all wrong. And what happens is that when you're in that stream of creativity, your unconscious genius gets going and says, oh yeah, when you finish this over there next year, you're going to want to do this. And it leaps ahead. It's so smart. And you get an image from the future, of, from future work, but it, you think it's a mistake in the present because it's not part of what you're working on now. So you've probably got pieces of future, great pieces of writing already <laughs> done. Congratulations. So then that kind of leads to a question I have. So do you look back on your very, very early work and see how you've progressed as artists? What do you well, see? Well, yes, I do. Um, and, you know, uh, well, people, you know, people keep telling me that I, you know, that I'm getting better each time, <laughs> you know, with the, each new print. I, you know, I, I look back at some of the old ones and I do really, you know, I feel like that, you know, really there was a lot there that I, you know, that I uh, still love. <laughs> You know, my, I mean, my, my favorite image that I've ever done is the, you know, the one of the two girls in the field, and, you know, that was, you know, that was in 2012. I'd been, you know, working seriously at wood engraving for, you know, I was, you know, that was the third year, and, you know, um, but I think, you know, um, I'm sure that I do build, you know, vocabulary uh, and, and build, you know, techniques, and you know, I learn more things about, you know, um, you know, not making a thing too busy, and uh, you know, and I, I incorporate those as, you know, as I go. And it seems to be, you know, it seems to be working. Yeah, I look back at my work and I think, oh, I thought I just had that idea last week. <laughs> there it was in my journal 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, I, better get, I better get around to it, finally. Yeah. So. All right. Perhaps we've, we've come to it. Um, thank you all for, for coming supporting the Leo and the artists that, that we got hanging up in here. Um, this concludes all of them. Uh, the show is open until August 17th. Um, and then our next exhibition opens the, f the week after the next week. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it'll be our faculty exhibition. So I um, can't remember how many of us there are right now. There's about seven or eight of us that will that'll be showing work. So come back for that too. Well, one thing um, I did bring a I did bring a little letterpress uh, of, of mine in with, uh, with a wood block and some 
you know, just so that uh, if anybody wants, we can, you know, we can print off a, uh, you know, a letterpress wood engraving, you know, uh, card. <laughs>